Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for watching this today. Thank you for being here, uh, for uh, watching or listening, or however you take in these services. Um, if you can believe it, it's now the first Sunday in August, which is hard for us to, I guess, to wrap our heads around. It um, just shows how much time's gone in during this lockdown and um, how long we've been doing this online. It's uh, it's crazy, really, and um, still looking forward to getting back to meeting with one another. But as it stands, we'll continue doing this for just a few more weeks and see how we see how we go. Uh, but I hope today's an encouragement to you, hope it's a real lesson to you, hope it's even enjoyable to you and uh, um, just hope that you're uh, encouraged in your faith or built up in your faith or perhaps for somebody watching that you may be coming to faith for the first time. Um, that's my prayer this morning. Um, and so what I wanted to do is just start by reading uh, from a psalm I wanted to read from. And what's a pretty well-known psalm? It's Psalm 19, which will maybe set us up for, well, for some of what we'll be thinking about today. So Psalm 19, we read this. The heavens declare the glory of God. The sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them there is a great reward. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me, then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Uh, we're going to sing our first song together, which is uh, an older one, which I think would be familiar to pretty much all of us I would think, but uh, older language and so on, but it's called uh, Be Thou My Vision, O Lord of My Heart. Be Thou My Vision, O Lord of My Heart, not be all else to me save that thou art thou my best thought by day or by night waking or sleeping thy presence my life Thou my wisdom and Thou my true word I ever with Thee and Thou with me, Lord Thou my great Father and I 
Thou mine inheritance now and always Thou and Thou only the first in my heart High King of heaven my treasure Thou It's a really wonderful song and encouraging him and that's what we want for our lives and that's what we want today to be about, to fixing our eyes and fixing our um, vision on Jesus, uh, focusing our hearts on him. So let's do that just now uh, as we pray together. Let me pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for today. We thank you for the fact that you've given us another day. And Lord, that we thank you for the fact that we are able to be here. We thank you that we are able to be where we are and that we are able to do this this morning on, on YouTube. Thank you for uh, the words of that song and our real desire this morning is to um, really have you as the vision of our life, the vision of our hearts, that you would be the focus uh, of our everyday life. Lord, that each day we would wake up and think how best we can uh, devote ourselves to you, how best we can um, do what you've given us to do for your glory to serve you, to honour you, uh, to shine as a light to others, uh, that other people may be drawn to you also. Lord, thank you for saving us. Thank you for making us your children, your sons and your daughters. Thank you that you love us. Thank you that you loved us so much that you gave your son Jesus in order to save us. Uh, he gave his life for us and we thank you for that. We praise you for that. We still have trouble getting our, our heads around it sometimes that you loved us so much that you, you gave him and that he willingly stepped forward and gave himself to be saved. We thank you that you, you have given us your Holy Spirit who lives within us, who dwells within us, that we are the temple of the, the Holy Spirit. We praise you for that and we pray that we would be spirit-filled people who live for you and who um, follow your leading and who uh, in each and every day are distinctively your children. Make us holy, Lord. Make us more and more like Jesus. We confess our sins to you this morning and ask for your forgiveness for the ways in which we have sinned against you this past week, even this past day, even this morning. And thank you that the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all our sin. And so we pray uh, that you'd be with us this morning, that we would hear your voice and that we would worship you uh, in spirit and truth today. So help us, Lord. Help uh, fix and focus our attention on you. It's so hard I think particularly at the moment when we're in our living rooms or um, in our kitchens or whatever, uh, watching uh, watching this, this service to be able to focus and to, for our minds not to drift. So Lord, we ask for your help in that. Uh, and uh, just thank you for this opportunity today. In Jesus' name, amen. So what I'd like to do now, as always, is read 
uh, this morning's passage that I'm going to be preaching from. We are continuing in, in Luke's Gospel. Uh, I'm going to read from Luke chapter 8. Uh, for those of you who were here last week, uh, we you'll remember we read the first 15 verses of Luke chapter 8, which included the well-known parable of the sower, and the focus of that was on hearing and responding to the Word of God. And that theme kind of continues today as we go in, into the... Um, continue in Luke 8 as we read uh, verses 16 to 21. So that's what we're going to be reading today. And it's really continuing that idea of hearing the word of God, responding and doing, actually living out, actually obeying it, actually what it means to truly hear uh, the word of God. So let's read that together. So it's Luke chapter 8 um, verses 16 uh, to 21. No one, after lighting a lamp, covers it with a jar or puts it under a bed, but puts it on a stand, so that those who enter may see the light. For nothing is hidden that will not be made manifest, nor is anything secret that will not be known and come to light. Take care then how you hear, for to the one who has, more will be given, and from the one who has not, even what he thinks that he has, will be taken away. Then his mother and his brothers came to him, but they could not reach him because of the crowd. And he was told, your mother and your brothers are standing outside, desiring to see you. But he answered them, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. Amen. We'll look at that passage together in a moment. Before we do, we're going to sing a, one more song, a very powerful uh, song that we tells the, the story of the gospel, but this, the power of the cross. Let's worship him together as we sing this. Oh 
Okay, let me pray once more before we look at the, the word together. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for the power of your word. Thank you that your word is alive and active and uh, Lord, it is awesome and awe-inspiring. Thank you for the words of Psalm 19 about how the, your word is your law and your word is desirable and it is perfect and it is um, life-giving, Lord. We thank you for that and we ask that by your spirit and by your words you would speak to us today and hear your voice and we too, Lord, would be hearers and doers of the word and that we would respond uh, in the right way and the appropriate way to the word of God today. In your name we ask it. Amen. Okay, so let me uh, let me begin today by asking you a question. <clears throat> Today's message. Question is this. Would you consider yourself to be a good listener? Someone who listens well, someone who, who hears well. Um, maybe as a as a very uncomfortable exercise you could if you're sitting at home with someone who's probably, if you are, then it's probably someone who's your closest relative, <laughs> knows you best. Uh, maybe you could ask them, do you, do you think I'm a good listener or I, I listen well? But maybe you shouldn't do that. That might cause more problems than I'm, I, I want to be blamed for. So, um, But the question is, are you somebody who listens well, somebody who really hears, very deliberately listens to what someone is saying? Uh, you don't interrupt or, or start talking about yourself or every kind of person asks a question and then doesn't wait for an answer, you give the, give the answer. You know, do you think of yourself as someone who really listens well? Uh, the reason I say that is because so much of this section that we've been looking at in Luke is to do with um, hearing and doing the word of God. So there's a sort of actual hearing that Jesus talks about, a kind of spiritual hearing, if you like, that he speaks of. Uh, we saw it last week when we looked at the parable of the sower. And there were these, uh, he, he describes this man going out to sow seeds, and the seeds land on different types of soil. Uh, and there's only one uh, good soil that it lands on. There's only one section of good soil that it lands on. And, and that good soil grows up and multiplies and so on. Brings forth a good crop. And he, and he uses that as an illustration to show how um, people who really hear the word of God are, those that are, the, are the last people. The people who uh, hold on, who multiply, who bear fruit, who hold fast to the word of God. Those are the true hearers of the word of God. Now these next, these two little sections that I read there, this ne next few verses, uh, it's no accident that they're put in straight after the parable of the sword. They're, they're there deliberately, they're there um, on purpose because it continues this idea, and this important concept of really hearing the word of God and the, the um, eternal importance of really hearing God's word. Of, uh, of really listening and doing and responding in the right way. And it's quite simply this. He teaches that those who hear the, truly hear the word of God are those who do it, uh, those who respond to it. And so that's what we have to look at in ourselves today, as we did last week, are we those who have truly uh, heard and responded to the word of God? And are we continuing to live in obedience to that word? Are we continuing to hear Christ's voice in his word? That we're looking at today and that we hopefully look at every day as we try to live for him, as we try to live out uh, our lives before him. And Jesus continues to make this point that he's made in the parable of the sower and he does this by first of all talking about a light or a lamp in verses 16 to 18. So he says that no one after lighting a lamp covers it with a jar or puts it under a bed but puts it on a stand so that those who enter may see the light. It's just a very simple point, isn't it? You know, think of a modern day equivalent. You're um, you're at home, you know, sitting in your living room with your family, and it's yeah, it's winter. Let's say it's winter, you know, in the dark evenings in your living room, and um, because we're in the northeast of Scotland, it's you know, it's dark at about four in the afternoon or about half two or something. Um, it starts to get dark, and you go, man, I need. You put on some light, and so you you put on the light. Great, everyone can see now. Now imagine you um, took that light uh, and you just put it right under the couch, and you just said, "Now that everyone can see, now that everyone can see what's going on, I'm just going to take that light. Do you mind if I put it down here? Is that okay?" And and the room is pretty much in darkness again, and and everyone that you're sitting with would be thinking, "You're an idiot. Put the light back up so that we can see what we're doing. Uh, there, why wouldn't you do that?" 
especially in a northeast of Scotland winter. Unlike now, where it's you know, it's almost light the whole day. You barely barely need a light if it's summer. It's all hot and sweaty, and you can't sleep. And I'm getting distracted, but um, you know, it's it's so light. But if you were uh, in that in that situation that we just described, it'd be ridiculous. And that's the point. It's a ridiculous illustration. That's what Jesus is making. He's saying you wouldn't. You wouldn't light a lamp and then cover it up because that defeats the purpose of the lamp. What's the point? Right. And so what he's doing here is he's illustrating uh, the Christian life. He's illustrating what we do when we respond to the gospel or what we shouldn't do and should do. He says, if you're someone who has heard the message of the gospel and has responded to it, if you've heard the word of God, two things will happen and, and you want to, two things to happen in your life. One is that you want to other people to hear this message. You want to hold up this light so that people can see it and respond to it. And also in the way that you live your life, uh, you want your own light to shine. You want people to be able to see that you are a Christian. You want people to be able to see that you're a follower of Jesus. And so you're, you want your light to shine. And this would be very, I think this would be very familiar uh, kind of, illustrations that Jesus would use if he was talking to the Jewish people um, and, and for us today if we're familiar with the Bible if we know the Bible it's not unusual to hear Jesus talking about light and darkness throughout God's word to hear God talking about light and darkness in order to uh, to represent some things so very prominent themes throughout the whole Bible right at the, I mean even right at the beginning I suppose of creation there was you know, before God created it, all these things, there was there was nothing. There was just there was God. There was nothing. There was darkness, and then God says, "Let there be light," and there was there was light. And uh, the very word of God throughout the Bible is described as a light for people to know God and to follow His ways. Um, you think of Psalm 119, uh, which says, "Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path." Uh, the word of God is illumination it brings light it brings understanding of God it brings revelation of God like uh, the psalm we read at the start psalm 19 is creation reveals to a certain extent but his word truly speaks uh, of him if you read John's gospel one of the themes that runs throughout that gospel is is light and darkness and how light represents knowledge of God understanding of God revelation of God and um, darkness represents those who are, don't know God and, and um, ignorance of God and, and not having that understanding. Uh, Jesus very famously says in John 8, he says, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And when he's having that, you know, really famous conversation with Nicodemus where he says, you know, truly I say to you, you must be born again. And um, he also talks about how that the... Um, uh, that those in darkness sometimes, um, well, those who respond to Jesus are those who, are like those who step out of the darkness and into the light, so that so that their sins may be exposed, that they may have life. And he says there's those other crazy people that see the light but want to stay in the darkness because they don't want their sin to be exposed, and they're quite happy where they are. Thank you very much. So God's word is revealed in that way. It's described as that way as light. It illuminates. It brings revelation it brings understanding it brings knowledge of God Jesus himself is, is sort of described as the word of God and John as well well what's interesting is that um, is that people uh, the people of God are also described as a light to those around them and this goes back to the you know the people of Israel in the, in, in the Old Testament who were uh, to be a light to the nations a light to those around them, an attractive drawing light. And they were to share God's word and preach God's word. And Jesus encourages his people to let your light shine before others so that they may know and glorify your Father in heaven. Not so they might glorify you, far from it, so they look at you and are pointed towards your Father. Again, just as another example, Philippians 2. You know, Paul writes to the church in Philippi and says, you, you know, talking to God's people, he says you're like lights that shine in the darkness. It's almost like a stars on a, on a really dark night. You shine in the darkness. 
Now, I say all of this, that was quite a lot of references, but I say all of this to make the point that we as Christians, from this passage and from others, are to hold up this light, to hold up this message of the gospel so that other people can see and respond to the good news about Jesus. And also that we live our lives as lights, we live our lives as Christians before other people. It's not so that people can be impressed with us, really, it's, it's so that people will see our faith as real and see that there has, something has happened within us. Um, and it's authentic and that, that will direct them to Jesus. We'll be those that point him to Jesus, like lights pointing people towards Christ. Verse 17 continues, For nothing is hidden that will not be made manifest, nor is anything secret that will not be known and come to light. So what is Jesus uh, getting at here? I think what he's saying is that eventually, uh, one day, uh, when we all stand before God, everything will be revealed. That is, everything in our hearts and in our minds, all of our sin will be exposed. As a, what a terrifying thought, you know, we talked about how when we come to faith now, there's a sense in which our, we step out of the darkness into the light and our, our sin's on display, but Christ takes it away. Um, but for those who don't do that, you know, we will all stand before him um, and everything will be revealed. Nothing will be hidden. Sins that folk have been able to hide from others, they won't be able to hide from God. Because the truth is that God already sees everything going on in our hearts. Uh, he's omniscient. He's all-knowing. So there's a, a sense in which we can keep some of our sin hidden from others, but God sees all of it. And all be exposed on the last day. Everything will be brought to light. And God will judge all people. And so it's as if Jesus is saying to believers, don't you hide that light. Don't bury it. Don't sort of throw it under the, bre under the bed. But let people see it. Let people hear that message. Don't you hide your light the way that other people hide their sin. Better to have it exposed now as in your sin rather and come to Christ. It's better to do that now, come to Christ and be saved than to let it sit there and hide and fester and be judged for it on the last day, on the day of Christ's judgment when Christ comes back. God's desire and our desire is for people to actually step out of the darkness into the light, have their sin exposed. Uh, not before us, but before God. But find life and light in Christ, in Jesus himself. He keeps going in verse 18 and says, Take care then how you hear. And so the interest in that is that how you hear. For to the one who has, more will be given. And from the one who has not, even what he thinks he has, will be taken away. Jesus is reminding them of what he said in the parable of the sower, or at least getting at that same point. Be careful how you hear. Hear and respond to the word in the right way. Those who have heard and responded correctly uh, will receive more. I think that is they will receive more of Jesus and his word and his and blessing of his presence and, and nearness. And as Christians, that's, a, that's actually a challenge for us, uh, to press into Jesus and hear more, have more of his word and more of him, so that we may grow and, and in turn we may reach others and share Christ with others. Uh, we need to be regularly, daily hearing God's word for ourselves. And we need it. Uh, to grow and to live in a way that honours God. But he says in a, in a chilling kind of way, uh, that the one who has, has not, even what he thinks he has, will be taken away. So at the end of the day, if you don't have Jesus, then you don't really have anything. On the last day, all the stuff that we have and have accumulated, uh, they're, they're great, some of that's great gifts from God, but they won't mean a whole lot when, if you stand before God and you don't have Jesus. And he asks, how did you respond to my son Jesus? That's, that's what's most important. Your possessions and the other things you have will be taken away. They won't help you then. You can't take them with you. You brought nothing into this world and you'll take nothing out. So come to Jesus today and be saved. Put your trust in him. Believe in him. And those of us who are Christians, uh, let's share that message and let our light shine 
before others. So having talked about the light and the darkness in order to press this point home, Jesus goes further, he uses another example, another illustration. Uh, well, actually it's not another example in that way, it's not a, him using an illustration, but it's a, it's a certain uh, scenario, something that happened in his life, and he kind of uses that in order to make a point. Continue to talk about truly hearing the word of God. Uh, and in this account, this includes his own family. We're told by Luke in verse 19 that his mother and brothers came to him, but they could not reach him because of the crowd. Again, these massive crowds come to hear Jesus. And he was told, your mother and your brothers are standing outside desiring to see you. But he answered them, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. Now when you first read this, <laughs> if you're reading this for the first time, it'd be easy to think, this sounds a little harsh. You know, it's just your mum, you know, wanting to see you, your siblings, your brothers. Um, I mean, what, what are you saying, Jesus? Are, are they not your family? You know, what's, what's that about? But what we have to remember here are a couple of things. Uh, one is that Jesus' immediate family actually weren't always that impressed with him. And at this point, I don't think his brothers believed in him. Uh, we learn later that at least two of his brothers did and became significant leaders in the church. But at this point, his brothers weren't really impressed with him. Um, <laughs> they didn't always embrace him. Probably thought he was a bit nuts um, with some of the things he did. And even his mother, Mary, she's demonstrated already back at the start, Luke, a great young woman of faith. And she will continue to be a great woman of faith. Uh, right up to the end, even when Jesus dies. And, and, and she's there at the resurrection. She's always there. But there's a sense in which she didn't always see eye to eye with Jesus. Uh, she didn't... Um, Sometimes she had a different agenda and sometimes she could be annoyed with him about different things or worried about him as his mum. So we have to, have to bear that in mind as well. Uh, but also, Jesus uses this opportunity to make a point. And what is that point? He's making the point that the true family of God, the true children of God, are those who hear God's word, respond to it and do it. Those who put their faith in Christ are the sort of our spiritual family. You see, there, there are two kinds of families referred to in the Bible. One is our um, biological family, to which we have a, um, a huge responsibility, obviously. Um, we know that uh, when we read Ephesians and Galatians and across the Bible, there's, there's that, our biological family. But there's also those who are our spiritual family, the church. Uh, the church, we're part of this big family centered on Christ and his gospel. If you can remember back to the first January, the first January, the, f the first Sunday of January this year, I was looking at a passage to preach for the year ahead and just for us to be thinking about together. Um, I preached from Titus 2 and we were thinking about the church as a family, a gospel centered family. Um, together the church is not just a club, it's not just a, a, a group we go to every week, so much more than that. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. We are family, uh, built together, brought together by Christ in the gospel. It's quite popular in, I think, uh, modern Western culture to hear things like, oh, we're, um, we're all, well, for anyone who actually, some folk who actually believe in God, you know, you might hear statements like, well, we're all God's children or we're all God, part of God's family. Well, that's not how the Bible talks about it. The Bible says that actually before we come to Christ, we are his enemies. Uh, that we are living in rebellion against him. That we don't want anything to do with him, really. And it's not until we come to Christ and we put our faith in him, we put our trust in him, that we are actually adopted into the family of God. We are adopted sons and daughters. You read about that in Galatians and Romans and so on. And it's a huge, incredible blessing to be adopted into this family of God and we have a we're part of the global family uh, of Christ but also we have local families as well and local churches there's a need for us to be part of that local church and sometimes people say oh well, I don't go to a local church because I'm part of the part of the global family of Christ and you're like well if you read the New Testament there's local churches that we're all to be a part of and um, so it's it's, a, it's out of obedience to him that we do that as Christians 
Uh, but he, here's what you have here is Jesus pointing out that his uh, true mother and brothers and sisters in this sense are his spiritual brothers and sisters. So he's saying these people sitting around me who have embraced the message, they are my brothers and sisters and mothers and so on. Even Mary, it <laughs> kind of shows that um, this is a verse, I think, against the kind of exaltation of Mary in church history where uh, it just isn't right. And you, you see her, she's she's not even on the same page as Jesus sometimes. She's not on the same agenda. She was a godly woman, but just a, just a woman, just like the rest of us, all the same, although she would demonstrate great faith. Uh, but his family don't get VIP treatment. Um, and uh, he, he recognises who his spiritual brothers and sisters in Christ are. So in wrapping all this up today and closing this morning, and this may have been a bit of a shorter message, but I think maybe not, but to be fair, it's a shorter passage, so <laughs> maybe I don't need to, 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 to drag it out more about what I want to say to you this morning or ask you this morning. So we, at the start, I talked about us, you know, are we good listeners? Are we people who really hear? Uh, and that's important in day-to-day -day life, but it's most important when it comes to Christ. Have we heard the word of God? Have we heard the gospel about what Jesus has come to do for us, to save us, that he lived, he came, he, he came to this earth, lived as a man, died for us, rose from the dead in order to save us, and we put our faith and our trust in him, and that is the only way for us to be saved. Have we turned to Jesus today? Have we followed him? Have we put our trust in him? Have we heard the word? Really heard it? Not heard it, truly listened and embraced it. I'm not just talking, obviously I'm not just talking about my particular message today, but that's part of it. But have we responded to the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ? And if we have truly heard and responded, that involves, uh, you know, if we've turned to Jesus, it will show in our lives. That involves not just a one-time decision, that involves devoting our lives to Jesus. You have, we have this light to show to others, not to keep to ourselves and hide. We have a message to proclaim, to tell. And some are more gifted at that than others. God gives the church particularly good evangelists, obviously, but you know, we all pray for those opportunities to, to speak, but you know, particularly as well to, um, to, to speak and to, to live our lives uh, as witnesses, as lights, that in the way we conduct ourselves, that the way we speak, just the way we act, just the way we work, the way we go about our daily lives, that people look and they say, well, that, guy, that person's a Christian. That's, that's, that's good. You know, that's a, that's a good example of somebody, a person of faith there. That is a, that is a very powerful witness wherever God has placed you. And often God places us in the seemingly ordinary situations. But it's through that, that through just our light shining before others, if we're walking with Christ, then that can have ex extraordinary effects. It can help draw people to Jesus. The people look at us and they say, hey, they take this faith seriously. Uh, or there has been a change in that person. That's a powerful witness, a powerful testimony. So let's continue uh, to grow in our Christian lives. Let's continue to hear and live out this word, really absorb God's word, take it in daily. Uh, and let's continue to grow together as a fellowship, as a family, because that's what we are. Uh, there's no such thing as an isolated Christian. Well, unless they've been placed in that position, of course, but uh, we shouldn't voluntarily do so. But Jesus saves us and makes us part of this global church family and wants us to be a part of a local church because they are our family. We need them and they need us. Uh, what a privilege to be considered a child of God and part of his family. What a blessing. We need each other. And if this time of COVID and lockdown and all that's been going on, if this has taught us anything, it's how much we need uh, our brothers and sisters in Christ. So let's help each other to obey God's word. Uh, those who truly love him, know him, obey his word. Let's be hearers and doers of his word today. Amen. So just as we, uh, just to kind of uh, respond to the message today, we're going to sing another hymn. Um, hallelujah, all I have is Christ. Um, hallelujah, Jesus is my life. And that's really the truth for the Christian. That, um, our life, Jesus is our life. Uh, to live for him, to obey him, to 
follow him, to love him, to know him. And we want to press in and know him even more uh, than we do already. So let's sing and worship him together.
just in closing our time this morning, often read uh, the benedictions from various New Testament letters, and I uh, just want to read the one from the letter to the Hebrews, which I'm, I'm sure I've read many times before, is very powerful. Uh, Hebrews 13 says, Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good, that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So thank you everyone for uh, watching today or listening or uh, whatever you, uh, however you, you watch this today. Uh, and just hope you have a great day and look forward to seeing you again soon. And we'll be, see you at some point during the week, I'm sure. And um, yes, uh, keep praying for one another during this time and um, keep in touch with one another as well. Keep looking out for each other. So I'll speak to you soon. Okay, bye.